Hello again and let's get started. Former chief executive of the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation says he will accept payments from the corporation as his end of service benefit a decade and a half after leaving office. Chachu Chikata has insisted the GNPC owes him even though he's not able to readily quantify uh, the amount. Now ac according to him the GNPC owes him salaries and provident fund benefits that were due him at the time of leaving office in 2001. Mr. Chikata was speaking on Joy FM Super Morning Show. I don't have access to all the data, so I don't actually have a figure. But the GMPC has been tough. For instance, with Provident Fund, I was not, you know, checking on the Provident Fund as it was paid by me and so on. And so the GMPC is in a best position to, uh, you know, establish these. The, the data are there in the, in the records of the GMPC. Okay, I wonder whether that doesn't pose a difficulty for you, because how will you know whether they pay? It does. Money? It does pose a difficulty for me, but obviously uh, I would expect them to act in good faith, especially if the representation that they have made to me is that they are trying to sort out a matter of entitlements within the context of a corporate decision that they have made. So I would expect them to act in good faith. And whatever documentation there is about all these uh, transactions, all these entitlements in the corporation, I'm sure I would have access to. The former chief executive officer of the GNPC, Chachu Chikata, says he was politically victimized. He revealed certain people were targeted in relation to the affairs of the GNPC. That is correct. Now, I agree with you that there's been confusion caused. I, I, I don't see my entitlements as an ex gratia payment. And I think that the description about end of service entitlements is more accurate. Now, I, that's why I said to you that I can't speak for other people in terms of their use of certain words. You know, I think the term, of, um, the, 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 the term ex gratia has been used in some loose ways in, in this country. And sometimes, for instance, in relation to, I think, members of parliament and so on, what they are paid at the end of their service is sometimes referred to as ex gratia and so on. I mean, I, you know, I can't speak to the different terminologies that different people use. What I'm addressing, what I'm concerned about, is based on representations that have indicated to me that the board of GMPC is concerned to resolve once and for all some outstanding issues of entitlements of certain officers being wrongly denied them and being denied, frankly, as a matter of political victimization. I think let's call a spade a spade. In 2001, there was a situation in which certain people were targeted in relation to the affairs of GMPC. That's, that's the reality we have to confront. That is another interesting part of this whole saga, because as far as we understand from following the headlines as they unfolded, mm -hmm. an, an announcement was made in December while uh, President Rawlings was still, right. uh, yes. you know, still the, the, the president. In relation to me, that yes. is correct. An announcement was made that I was being made an advisor in the, to the Minister of Energy. That announcement was made in the early part of December. And after that announcement was made, as you know, elections took place in this country. And after the elections, there was a new government. Now, uh, that announcement having been made, I have to tell you that I actually never received any official notification. Probably that was overtaken by events in the circumstances. So what happened was that I had outstanding leave, and I took that outstanding leave after having waited, obviously, for the, the communication to me, which I didn't receive. But as I said, I, I saw that events you know, had overtaken uh, whatever had been announced. And, and in that context, I wrote handing over notes, and then I took my leave. And, and it was during that, and during that period of leave, as I mentioned, even salary payments were denied. And that already began to show to me um, the fact that there was really no interest in, in addressing my contractual entitlements because, I mean, salary payments during a period of leave, that's very basic. And to the extent that other people 
were being paid their salaries, I would expect the same thing would happen to me. But it didn't happen. And, and, and so I think that we, we've got to, and, and not only did that not happen, but very soon I was um, subjected to being taken to court and... Meanwhile, the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation is scheduled to meet the Energy Committee of Parliament today as a, to look into investigations into the payment of some end-of-service benefits regarding the issue Mr. Chikata was talking about. When we get any information, we'll make sure and let you have your share. Now, let's talk about Charles Entry. The man who reportedly confessed to attempting to assassinate President Mahama has been cleared by the Accra Psychiatric Hospital. A court earlier ordered his psychiatric evaluation after he was arrested and slapped with a 10-year jail sentence for unlawful possession of arms. He was then released into the care of the psychiatric hospital. Let's also speak with, uh, let's get on the phone lines and speak with his lawyer, uh, Francis Xavier Sosu. Good afternoon to you and thank you uh, for joining us. Um, what can you tell us about his release? Hello, Francis. Hi. Um, good morning, and a very, very good morning to your cherished viewers. Good afternoon to you, and thank you for joining us. Francis, um, your client has been released from the Accra Psychiatric Hospital. What was the evaluation? Um, well, um, thank you once again. I must say that I have also heard reports of um, his complete healing. Um, but I haven't independently confirmed that yet. I've been trying to make efforts. In fact, I've made efforts to reach uh, Dr. Kotose, who is the lead medical doctor, uh, taking care of him. But I haven't been successful yet. So I'm sure as soon as I'm able to confirm that, we will know exactly what will be the next stage or the next line of action that we will be taking. But I can assure you that uh, we are most likely to come under the Mental Health Act and apply to the court for him to be discharged and released to the family um, for, you know, further medical attention. So what happens? Uh, will your client be prosecuted again? Uh, I beg your pardon uh, if you can say that again. The question I'm asking is, is your client liable to another prosecution? Um, I know that it will uh, be a, a decision of the Attorney General, but I, I really doubt if the Attorney General will be willing to you know, go by that line, particularly when it's ascertained that at the time that this whole thing happened, uh, he was completely a lunatic and did not understand uh, the basis of anything that, that, that took place. And we are all aware of the drama that has gone on as far as this case is concerned, his incarceration, and eventually... Uh, the Human Rights Court decision to quash the decision of the lower court and all that. So I believe that the, the twist and turns of this case, uh, in my view, uh, should settle the issue if he's, uh, he's declared to be mentally fit and he can be handed over to the family, subject to an undertaking by the family that they are going to make sure that he's catered for well and taken to uh, uh, monthly reviews or consistent reviews, I believe that should settle the issue without necessarily calling for a retrial or so, a rearrangement or something before the court. So the bottom line is that um, you cannot confirm the, the evaluation, whether or not he was mentally fit or not, until you get in, in touch with the psychiatric hospital? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Once we have that information, we can firmly speak to that. For the period where he was admitted there, were you in touch with him? Oh, yes, we were uh, occasionally in touch, not always. Uh, we, I have been part of his uh, attendance to the hospital once. Uh, I was in the hospital with him myself at a psychiatric hospital. Uh, subsequently, the family were doing the follow-up for us. And uh, when this report came out, I quickly you know, got in touch with the family to find out what they have picked up from this report. And according to the family, they had actually visited him, you know, at uh, uh, the, the hospital there, where their interaction with him clearly showed that he, he was okay because he now, now could clearly say that, well, he's not interested in killing president, uh, he's fine, and he could now ask about the family and all that. 
So I am taking their word that he's doing well, but I have to independently confirm that from the medical doctor before we can take subsequent action. Very well. Thank you very much. That's lawyer Francis Xavier Susu. Today, Wednesday, December 9, is International Anti-Corruption Day, and the theme globally is on breaking the corruption chain. Now, as the world marks Anti-Corruption Day, the Center for Democratic Development, Ghana, is calling on governments, the private sector, and non-governmental organizations, the media, and citizens to join forces to fight the menace. Rex Fordisiyama, who is a research assistant at the center, uh, joins us over the telephone for more. Rex Ford, thank you for joining us on the news. The CDD concedes that the fight against corruption is a joint effort. So is that what's happening? You know, uh, good afternoon, madam, and uh, good afternoon to your listeners. Um, we believe so. Um, that is the case. Of course, there have been efforts um, towards the fight. And indeed, today, um, the Shiraj, in conjunction with the Office of the President, is uh, organizing a stakeholder dialogue between governments and different stakeholders um, to discuss the national anti-corruption plan, action plan, and then also to provide a progress report on uh, on this action plan. Um, so it's, it's one of the efforts, and we believe that there are many more in the future. Uh, for CDG, we are also saying that despite these efforts, we still need to do some more. There's more room for improvement uh, by government and non-governmental organizations particularly uh, anti-corruption bodies and citizens in general to improve and, you know, uh, join the fight against uh, corruption. But is it not a lot of talk than action when it comes to corruption? We, we hear about it. Um, we don't ever get to see, Ghanaians don't ever get to see um, corruption cases pursued to the very bottom. The very novel one is the judicial corruption that was done by a NAS. But separating or isolating this case, we don't see that happen in Ghana. Well, um, perceptions about corruption have increased, which is, which is worrying. And, and that is why our statement is particularly um, saying that there's still more to do. And you are right um, in saying that there's very little action and we see a lot more talk. But um, we will start from somewhere and talking about it uh, is, is the beginning. We are still encouraging that um, the action must continue. There must be more. The work that has been done by us is, is, is a good step and step in the right direction, but then there must be more. We are calling particularly on state anti-corruption bodies um, <coughs> and non-governmental organizations to join and lead and do some more um, in the fight against corruption. So, yes, there has been very little done, but um, there's still more room for improvement. We are sure that if we do, if we do things right, we should be able to win this fight. Yesterday, we had some conversation with ordinary Ghanaians uh, following the, the, the uh, sacking of some judges uh, in the judicial corruption scandal. For many Ghanaians, the problem for them is that the, the sanctions are not deterrent enough. And some of them even called for the prosecution of these sacked judges. Mm. Well, um, the... The sacking of the judges is, well, in the mind of the judicial arm, um, uh, probably the, the right direction to take, which is good that the state um, thinks that these judges, having, having committed uh, some offenses, should, uh, should be punished for their crimes. Um, so in my personal opinion, I think that it, it, it's the beginning of, 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 um, of such, such acts like this which is why the work by NAS and many other um, anti-corruption bodies and even the Afrobarometer service that we run um, <laughs> try to point to evidence of this. We want to see how um, the state acts after such evidence is, is, is presented. The Afrobarometer survey uh, and the Round 6 survey has pointed to increased perceptions of uh, corruption um, in different aspects of, of, of the country or different sectors of of the country, including the judiciary. And the response by the judiciary now is, uh, to some extent, um, warming to, to at least know that they are quick um, um, in, 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 in their, their response to, to dealing with corruption. And they are also of the idea of tolerating no, no, no corruption. Very well. Now, yeah. so today, Ghana is launching 
the anti-corruption policy. What will change after that? Will it be another document launched, which we'll talk about, or will there be material change? Well, you know, um, we should all keep out and, and, and look out for, for what happens after this, particularly the anti-corruption action plan. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic piece. Um, but as you know, for this country, we do have nice plans. Implementing them is, is usually a problem. Um, so going forward, we expect to see some more, um, some more being done to implement uh, action plans against anti-corruption, some more work that is done by uh, civil society or non-governmental um, organizations towards exposing uh, corruption or uh, corruption studies that are, you know, that enlighten us more on, on this fight. We've already, in the statement, we've mentioned that corruption ends its practice some $1 million and over. Okay. And that means that it's becoming more costly over time. Um, uh, for these, Talking uh, about costs, do we have an idea how much Ghana loses to corruption? Uh, unfortunately, no. We, um, I, I haven't cited any studies that have estimated the economic cost of, of corruption to Ghana. And perhaps that is, that is even one area um, that we can begin from, because knowing the idea of how much we are losing uh, in terms of economic resources should give us an idea of the opportunity cost of of such resources to, to well. act as a country. Very well. Thank you very much. And that's uh, Rex for the CMA. He's a research assistant at the CDD. we we'll stay with the topic. And my colleague, MFA Ewenami Tiamoeli, has been speaking with Linda Ofori Kwafo. She's with the Ghana Anti Corruption uh, Coalition. And also some market women on corruption perception and the impact. The 9th of December on the United Nations calendar every year is used to raise awareness on issues of corruption and the need to fight against it. This year here in Ghana, event planners are focusing on robbing women into the fight against corruption. Here at the Malamata market, some women will be sharing their stories with us as far as their day-to-day -day activities here on the market are concerned and how they have been fighting corruption in their own little way. I have with me currently Madam Juliana Abuaji and she'll be telling us more on her activities here at the markets. Hello Madam uh, Juliana, welcome to Joy News. When they say corruption, how do you understand it? It means uh, maybe the person taking what he or she shouldn't take. It's right. Okay. Or doing something that is not right. In your capacity as a woman, on the national level, how do you think you can help beef up the fight against corruption in Ghana? Okay, as an advice or a counsel to everyone here in Ghana, the th corruption is not something that uh, you you punish the person for it, but pe punish the person for it. But I see it's something being done willingly. Like I, for instance, I say that no. I won't take any drugs. I don't want to do drugs. I don't want to take alcohol. I can control myself on that. So if anyone decides that, no, I won't take what I know that I shouldn't take, the person thinks I don't, I won't take what I, I shouldn't take, I think it will help us a lot. What role has the market woman got to play in fighting corruption at the national level? Thank you very much. The market woman is... Um, a very important factor in the fight against corruption. Actually, we aim at targeting women. And then if you want to mean the place you can find them is this place. The reason being that the negative effects of corruption impacts more on women. When corruption happens, women suffer, children suffer, when it has to do with education, when it has to do with health, when it has to do with getting the basic necessities of life, like food, like water, because you know corruption impacts negatively on the delivery of all these things. And it's the woman at home who plays the role in getting these things for the household and not necessarily the man. The man might give out the money or but if what if the man gives money and it's not enough. We are try, trying to empower them that when they go to seek medical care for their children, when they go to assess education for their children, everything that they are doing, so far as they know the basics about corruption, 
they would be able to resist it whenever it happens. Report it whenever they encounter one. And also, especially when it comes to national elections, if you have realized, women play a very important role in elections. And luckily next year, we are going into an election. We are going to use this anti-corruption day to sensitize them against the negative effect of corruption on elections. So when they come to them in the market, give them bribes, T-shirts, um, uh, how do you call it, five, five cities and the rest, and ask them to vote for their party. They should be able to ask them about the issues that are happening on corruption and what the government or anybody seeking them, uh, seeking their votes has been able to do about it. We have what we call the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan. If, are they going to enforce that? Are they going to implement the plan? We want to empower the market women to be able to ask such questions when politicians come to them to seek for their votes and not necessarily always, don't want it to be there. Every day, five cities, still well, President Mahama has launched Ghana's anti-corruption policy, and we'll be talking about that as and when we get some information right after this break. You don't want to go away. Welcome back to join News Today with me, Francisca Kakraforce. And now the Public Relations Officer of the School Feeding Program, Siba Alpha, says the Secretariat is working on meetings, working at meeting the goals of the new phase of the program. According to him, the program has migrated caterers onto an e-pain payment platform to facilitate uh, payment and also mitigate the challenges he was speaking on the AM show. We have been making payments since the school feeding program was relocated to the, uh, under the ministry. You know, mm -hmm. as you have just said in, in your intro, the ministerial oversight responsibility of the program has changed from the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development to the Ministry of Gender, Children and Child Protection. And so as we speak, last month we were able to pay 64 days of the feeding grant to caterers. That, that was uh, the, the days actually should be 69. But, we're able but you've, been pay, you've been able to pay 64. 64, and there's five days outstanding. Mm -hmm. That is for second term of 2014-2015 academic year. And for, 2000, uh, for the third term, we owe them 55 days, which the money is ready. But because of some of the changes, the restructuring that uh, has been initiated, we, there was this uh, up, uh, audit assessment in the school feeding program. And so the, the findings of the audits would inform us as to how to make this payment. Because so let me, let me understand this. You owe them third term. Yes, for the, for the um, let me but make because it clear. This is, a, you know, this is a first term. This, this is, is the first beginning yeah, of a, is, a new calendar. Exactly. This is first term. Yeah. But you owe them the previous term. Yes, yes. That's what I, I was trying to explain. So how do they cook for the children now? We, we have paid them last month. You said you, you paid 64? Yes, 64 days. Uh, and then we are now going to pay the 60 days because it was supposed to be 69. How does it work? Maybe we should go back to the beginning. How does the payment system work? Yes. Uh, that would take us to the, some of the reforms that uh, we are introducing. Actually, we are now using the, the electronic payment system whereby monies are transmitted electronically to caterers. And so two uh, organizations were involved in this. The, one, the first one is GIPS, Ghana Interbank Payment and Settlement System. That's GIPS. And then the MTN, uh, MTN uh, what do you call it? Uh, mobile money. Mobile money. Okay. And so uh, we have zoned the country to two. The GIPS, they are in charge of the, uh, what do you call it, Nordic region, the three Nordic regions, Ashanti region, as, as well as Bonaf region. And the rest of the five regions is being taken by, uh, what do you call it, uh, MTN. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we do is that the essence, which is very important, of this uh, transformation is to be able to curtail the delays that we normally encounter whenever we do the releases. Sometimes we do the releases, government will release, but it takes about not less than two months or three months. Some assemblies even delay about up to three months. But I must also say that some assemblies, assemblies majority of them are doing very well in terms of the, uh, the, the expeditious uh, release of the funds. So a research conducted by the National Commission for Civic Education uh, on Media and Democracy has revealed that most Ghanaians wa want more restrictions for the media. Now, the research conducted in 2014 was to assess the public's notion on the media and their work. Join News' Hannah Odame joins us with more on the research findings. Hannah, good afternoon to you. Give us more details from this research. 
Uncle Spikenbelly, here. You can you please repeat your question? Hannah, let's talk about the, the research uh, by the NCCE regarding uh, the restrictions for the media. We understand they're saying that uh, exactly. the, the public yeah. wants more restrictions for the media. Yeah. What else is the re research material telling us? Exactly, Francisca. The, the majority of the respondents ask for the restriction because according to them, the kind of content that is being churned out by the media is not sometimes entirely factual, others are not balanced. And also some are very unethical, especially the ones that bothers and centers on discussions. And so these respondents charged on regulators and especially media owners to use the rules. There are rules governing journalism, there are rules governing reportage. They want them to use the rules on reporting and also apply sanctions when necessary because I think to them most of the time when these things happen, we do not apply the sanctions. And also, Francisca, the uh, media practitioners that are here make some submissions. Professor Audrey Gadget, for instance, talked about the broadcasting bill. She said that the media needs a broadcasting bill. It's something that we've been talking about for years. But unfortunately, there are so many loopholes in it that have to be worked on. So unless that is done, it's not too right for us to um, keep pushing for the uh, broadcasting bill to be made into law. You know, that has punitive measures. It has to survive. So when eventually it becomes a law, at least it will regulate a lot of the things that are chained out. Also, Professor Kakari is here, and he said that one thing that can help is delayed broadcasting mechanism. We all know that about a decade ago, the U.S. Jet, the US embassy gave some media houses these equipment to be able to have delayed broadcasting as a means of um, um, and regulating whatever information that goes out. But unfortunately, most of these media houses did not use it, and so we still see all the in court charge that comes out of some of these media houses. He was not too happy about it. Also, um, Professor Audrey Gadeko again talked about um, media owners. He says that the owners who ensure that the information that are turned out are very important. Now, one, one other thing that also came out is that, you know, most of the time we talk about media houses leaning towards a particular political party. Mm -hmm. Well, the discussions were like, it's not wrong because at the end of the day, everybody has and uh, um, the, the, the right to be highly inclined to a particular political party. What makes it wrong is when you continue to report just for one side everything that the political party that you belong to, the media house, is linked towards is right, and what the other person does is not right. That's not what they want. Okay. They're saying that we can all know that this is black, this is white, but at least try as much as possible to have a balanced reportage. Then we can say that this particular media house is doing the right thing. For very well. Time. Interesting revelations there. Thank you very much. That's Hannah Odame, our reporter. Now, the national executives of the People's National Convention, PNC, are being accused of deliberately bending the party's rules in order to protect the interest of certain elements in the party. Henry Asante, one of three party members who has gone to court to put a hold on the PNC's upcoming Congress, earlier on news desk said he's also at a loss as to why the party has cleared Bernard Mona to contest in the party's primaries, despite perpetrating an illegality. We petitioned the voting and the nomination committee. They received our petition. And then NEC was called to dilate on this issue. When this matter was proved before NEC, the highest decision make, making body, sorry, the second highest decision making body, the national chairman overruled, you say his veto power to say that he has stepped on it. So he will give us his credit. We met the national chairman. All that he did was to appeal to us to let peace prevail. But we felt cheated. But that is the latest phase of reality. It's a matter of legality. Did Bernard Mona pay or he did not pay? Let us know. If he did not pay, then we apply the rule of justice. So naturally, that's where we are trading from. When they met, the very committee sat on the matter, and they said our case is bogus because we have no, we have no solid point. Invariably, the committee, the very committee, asked Bernard Mona to go and pay on 23rd of last month, when the deadline was 20, uh, on the 13th. So the 23rd of last month, Bernard Mona went to the bank and paid into. You see where the dichotomy arises. Here was a case when Dr. Mensabu, our former national chairman, traveled all the way from Canada on two solid occasions to file his nomination. They are part of the money to pay him and promised to pay the other by a uh, projected check. The very committee refused him, gave him only two hours to the chairman to the uh, what the answer, that they should give him only two hours to make up that payment. When he could not make it, they disqualified him. Why? It's not about to depend from Bernard Mona. What kind of justice are we applying here? This is all we are saying that look, since we have not seen justice within, it's better we go without. 
A policy analyst and a member of the party, Atik Muhammad, has meanwhile expressed worry over the recent happenings in the party, describing the situation as one that portrays that the party is not serious. Uh, he says executives of the party will have to set up if the party is to stand any real chance in next year's general elections. Personally, I don't know what, what the situation or what the legal position would be. Now that a process has been or an action has been uh, actuated in the court, I do not know whether it is possible to even strike a compromise. Otherwise, originally I was for a compromise that in the interest, I mean the bigger interest, for the sake of our common good, could we, you know, let sleeping dogs lie, let's try to massage things a bit. And in doing so, we should also communicate it very well so that Ghanaians don't get the wrong impression that we are condoning wrongs or illegalities. But where we have got to, I initially was of the opinion that whoever offends our regulations should be made to face the full implications. Mm. But looking at the, 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 the likely effect that was, I mean, that was going to have on our Congress, I said let's try to compromise. But where we have got to, I don't think there is any room for any compromise anymore. And to that extent, I would only wish that this is done expeditiously so that we can go to our Congress if the petitioners think that there are some claims they can be taken in court in defense of the rules and regulations of the party. And some news just coming in is that a student of the All Nations University in the Eastern Region has fallen from a story building to his death. We are joined on the telephone lines by our reporter Kofi Sian for more. Kofi, good afternoon to you. Tell us exactly what happened. Uh, Francesca, uh, school authorities, they have officially not told us about exactly uh, what happened or they have failed to confirm the incident but uh, uh, an official of the school I should say uh, who confided in me confirmed the incident to me we rushed to the school and from all indications it seems uh, something just something has happened there and we've had the opportunity to see for ourselves pictures of a student who has fallen from the fourth floor of their school hostel. But as of now, uh, we cannot tell what exactly pushed him or why he fell from that uh, height of the building to the floor. So that is what is happening here. Policemen are around and they have cordoned off the place. And the ambulance have also, has also come for uh, the body of the dead student. All right, we'll leave it here. That's uh, Kofi Sian from the Eastern Region giving us uh, that latest story on a student falling to his death. You're watching Joy News today with me, Francisca Kakwa Force. We'll take a break and bring you the latest in business. Welcome back. Let's do some business now. The Ghana Revenue Authority is ready to roll out the Income Tax Act 2015, which will increase the threshold for withholding tax from 500 CDs to 2,000 Ghana CDs. At the launch of the Act, Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, George Blankson, reiterated the Act will, among other things, limit the mortgage interest deductions for individuals to just one building for a lifetime. The Income Tax Act 2015 revises the law relating to income tax in Ghana. According to the Ghana Revenue Authority, the Act will broaden the tax base, remove the narrow and distorted tax base of the Internal Revenue Act 2000, rationalize, streamline and restrict tax concessions, tackle erosion of the tax base, as well as align domestic tax rules with current international tax rules. At the launch of the Act, which has been assented by President Mahama and is already taking effect, Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, George Blankson, stressed the Act will encourage voluntary compliance by taxpayers with their tax obligations. Dominance of voluntary compliance in the tax system allow the tax authorities, in this case the GRA, to concentrate its resources on identifying and dealing effectively with taxpayers who fail to fully comply with their tax obligations. Without a doubt, the most successful tax administrations around the world 
continuously encourage and strive to maintain a high degree of voluntary compliance. Deputy Finance Minister Mona Koti called on the GRA to sensitize the general public on the new act in order to receive the necessary compliance. For a number of reasons, efficient tax administration is a major problem in developing countries. Not only do developing governments face an uphill battle in bringing individuals and businesses into the taxation process, but there are also challenges arising from the insufficient administrative staff, high levels of illiteracy among taxpayers, lack of sufficient equipment and facilities, and lack of reliable statistical data. I am inclined to think that successful sensitization efforts, coupled with the willingness of our countrymen and women to do their part of the social contract, will inure to the benefit of government and the citizens at large. Ghana's tax regime has been criticized by stakeholders at the National Tax Consultative Meeting in Accra. The current regime, as it stands, grants tax holiday, uh, holidays to multinational companies that invest in the country. In an interview with Joy News, Executive Director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, Mr. Vitus Azim, said the current regime must be re reconsidered. Uh, for a very long time, Ghana and a lot of uh, developing countries, especially African countries, have always been persuaded into giving tax incentives to multinational companies uh, to entice them to come and invest in the country. Because uh, we, especially with regards to the natural resources, it re they say it requires huge, huge funds to be able to actually invest. But then some of these uh, incentives are being abused. Some have outlived their usefulness. And we think that the government needs to take a second v uh, look at these incentives. For example, talking about abuse, for example, some uh, companies will come, set up, get a tax holiday of 10 years. At after 10 years, they change a name and register again as a new, uh, a new company and begin to get the same tax uh, holidays. You see, so as a, at the end of the day, the government or the country is losing revenues that we could have used for the development of this country. Besides, somebody will also say that even the incentives that they are giving to these foreign companies, the Ghanaian private sector does not get these uh, incentives, which means that we are never, our local companies are never pr uh, helped to grow. And when they are not helped to grow, they can never compete with these international companies that are coming to the country. So that's one th aspect. That's it for business. Stay with us for sports. This is Joy News today. It's time now for the latest in sports. Benedict Ousu joins us looking good. <laughs> Dashing? Well, I'm, I'm learning from you. I see. <laughs> now, there's a fight in the Hearts camp between yeah. the coaches. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Uh, you know, the, their new coach, Kanichi Yashiwashi, who came from uh, America and uh, Sabankwe, there's been some exchanges between the two. Last Monday, there were reports that uh, the two had some altercations and their general manager has come out to confirm it. So I hope it didn't get physical. No, not, not at all, not at all. So hmm. we'll find out uh, in sports. Take it away. All right, okay. So we'll start with Accra Hearts of Oak and there was a best up between Hearts coach Kenichi Yasuhashi and team manager Sabankwe at the team's Monday training session. Now, that is according to manager Gerard Ankara. Now, it was reported that the Japanese-American trainer asked Saban to shut up during a briefing with the players when he tried to talk technical matters. The Black Stars team manager got furious as they engaged in some exchanges in front of the players. Now, Jared Ankara has explained the issue and stating that they have sorted out matters. Differences between coaches and so on and so forth, we all know they are human institutions. Definitely, those differences will come. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. to, to, to say that there is an oversimplification, oh, if that, there is a, there, there, uh, there is a, 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 a problem, between two personalities and for that reason or two positions of the same club and for that reason it looks like one job is overlapping into the other what do you do no you don't even write you show the job descriptions of the various yes. i have done the job description for the coach and i've done the job description for the team manager mm -hmm. you see and that is what uh, 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 an administrator should do i wouldn't say it was even an insult or blows no an action that hey 
um, I think this should this job should be taken over. Is the manager the team manager's job or the coach's job or the assistant coach's job? Okay, and there are no properly laid down issues uh, uh, descriptions. These are the problems you have, and it's been done. Everybody is happy with what what, what they are with so what they are. And that's definitely a great one by Kofi Kenata. Kakram, have you ever been caught in exam or practice before? No. Oh, I, 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 I tried, no, I tried I, to I wasn't stay expecting away. you to say yes. Would you I have? mean, everybody will say no, but of I course. honestly try to stay okay. away from that. So that's the story. I heard that Ghana's most beautiful 2014 first runner-up, Ewenam, was caught in some more practice at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, Gempa, and she came by the Joy at the Mall on Sunday. So, you know, out of curiosity, I thought to find out what really happened. Has she been expelled from school? And what's actually she going to do if Gempa refuses to call her back to school. It stated in the letter that you found culpable trying to communicate to another candidate. And then you tried to justify your case. You didn't show remorse and was rude. For that matter, you are dismissed from Gimpa. Have they said anything like, okay, we are working on getting you back or they have not accepted your apology? I wrote to them and they haven't responded. I went back to find out if they have received my letter and they said yes, they have, but um, the committees that are responsible for, you know, issues like this haven't sat. Are you hoping that they'll call you? Um, I'm hoping that they call me because um, anyone who hears of this goes like, really? And of course, our checks are again, tell us that they have given her all avenues to prove herself not guilty. And so they don't want to treat her as a special case. Kakra, Reggie and Boli. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday we were allowed to go home and you know they had massive expansion. So let's keep our fingers crossed. They ah, keep praying for them. I have double to fingers win. crossed. <laughs> yes, it's going to be really big for Ghana. Sure, it is. Okay. And even if, if they don't win, we are still proud we're of still them. We're still proud of they them. Made us but lovely. they should win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's yeah. it. Thank you very Thank much, you, Ms. G. And that's it for Entertainment News. Well, that's how we wrap up on Joy News today. There's more news on myjoyonline.com. My name is Francisca Kakwa Thank you very much for your company. Bye-bye.